Does the board come to order? I am Marlo Richardson, the committee chair. Are we all here? Only board members who are members of the committee may sit at the table. Other board members who are in attendance must observe from the audience. If a quorum of the board is present, those members who are observing cannot participate in discussion. Do we have a quorum? Yes. Can I call the roll? Yes, roll please. Marla Richardson? Here. Dave Diaz? Here. Pastor Herrera? Here. Ed Lang? Here. Frank Shutter? Here. Johnny Simpson? Here. Nancy Springer? Here. Next, I would like to invite uh, everyone to introduce themselves, beginning from my left. Laura Zuniga, Chief of Licensing. Dave Diaz, Board Member. Johnny Simpson, Board Member. Tanya Corcoran, Chief Deputy Registrar. Christy Shields, Counsel for the Board. Uh, Mike Janeski, Chief of Legislation. Jesse Flores, Deputy Chief Enforcement. Frank Shutter, Board Member. Pastor Herrera, Board Member. Nancy Springer, board member. David Fell, registrar. Ed Lang, board member. Again, Marlo Richardson, uh, committee chair. There's one change to the package. Uh, page 66 and 67 are duplicates, so we're going to disregard those two pages. Any comments from the board members? You have copies of the corrected pages, I think, at your um, place, and then there's handouts in the back. Okay, moving forward, I'm pleased to acknowledge the achievements of the licensing division in significantly reducing processing times and continuing to fill positions in the division. Public comment. This item is provided for public comment pertaining to items on the agenda as well as items not on the agenda. However, the committee cannot take any action on items on the agenda. The CSOB welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda. And it is the CSOB's intent to ask for public comment prior to the committee's taking action on any agenda item. But if for some reason we forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, a member of the public desiring to comment on the item should raise their hand and will be recognized. Also to allow the committee sufficient time to conduct its scheduled business, we will be limiting public comments to five minutes per individuals. Are there any individuals that wish to address the committee at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will head over to our licensing program update and I will pass it on to Laura Zuniga. Thank you. This item begins on page 57 of the packet. Uh, so on this page you have information on the number of applications we've received um, over the last year. Um, we don't have the January numbers in here in the packet, but I did look at them before the meeting and uh, I just want to note that for original exam applications and original waiver applications in particular, we saw a significant increase. In January, we received 1,254 original exam apps and for waiver applications, we received 736. Uh, the other categories were up as well, uh, but those two were the most significant. In the chart below, you can see the applications received um, over the prior few calendar years. And then just to add that the 2017 number is approximately 38,600, so fairly comparable to 2016. Uh, moving on, you can see on page 58 the number of applications processed per month, and then as well as the applications over the prior calendar years. Um, then we have information describing what process is, can involve um, several different steps in the application processing. Uh, on page 59, you can see um, a chart we added last year, the average weeks for initial processing by month um, for each of the different types of, for most of the different types of um, documents we receive in licensing. I do want to note in here, you can see in December, original exam applications was at eight, approximately eight and a half weeks. Um, I just want to thank the staff in licensing in exam applications and many other units as well. Um, the staff worked really hard to bring down these times. Um, staff put in a lot of overtime. We had staff um, taking on additional responsibilities. And we're currently at two weeks for the processing of original exam applications. So I just want to thank everyone um, for their efforts there. It's been tremendous. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't show here. We also um, had a backlog of renewal applications, or maybe it doesn't show quite as high. Um, and we're also able to bring that down to approximately two weeks. So um, thanks to our staff. Um, and then on page 60, there's information about um, each the, some of the main applications we receive um, and then the total weeks by processing broken down by type of application. And then each step in the process, you can see um, 
the corrections and the time it takes um, to get it back for corrections and then to issuance. Um, we continue to have approximately 50% of our applications um, we're not able to accept and need to be returned for correction, which delays the processing. Uh, on to page 61, just the chart, the disposition of applications by calendar year. Um, any questions so far? Okay. And then on to page 62, information on workers' compensation recertification. Uh, these numbers don't change significantly, so we have approximately 55% of our licensees with an uh, exemption from workers' compensation on file. On page 63 is the chart by classification. This also stays fairly consistent, uh, the information. Page 64, information um, about our criminal background unit. Um, and then the chart with our statistics, as you can see, the number of denials based on the criminal background check uh, continues to be quite low. On page 65, we have information on our experience verification unit. Uh, our regulations require 3% of our applications to be randomly selected for a more um, comprehensive investigation of the experience. And you can see in here um, information over the last calendar year and statistics. And then on to the next page, one of the replacement charts in here has been taken down by classification. I did want to indicate at the December board meeting there were some comments made that indicated the denial rate for applications in, that go through EVU, Experience Verification Unit, is 50 percent, and that's not the case. It's typically between 20 to 22 percent, and that percentage has been fairly consistent over at least the last 10 years. Any questions there? And then on the next page is information on the Licensing Information Center. Um, as you can see the Licensing Information Center, they did a great job as well last year in bringing down our call wait times and it's um, continuing to stay low. And then finally on page 68 and 69, information on our judgment unit and with details about the monetary savings to the public. Any questions? Nancy, you had a comment? Uh, I'm Speaking of turn that, I just wanted to make a note previous to Laura speaking there that when we had received this packet to go with our agenda that this is the first time we're receiving this information. I just wanted that to be noted. It says agenda item H, but just wanted. Okay, so for agenda item H are some letters they, that we received them in, within the last day or two here at the board. So, yeah, yeah apologies. We didn't include them in the packet. We didn't have them at the time we put the packet together, as well as they're representing one side. And so typically we just put our material in the packet versus allowing people to present their own. Do any committee members have any comments on that item? Any public comments? Moving on to the testing program update. Wendy. I remember to turn it on. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, the testing update starts on page 73. The testing division is, uh, is responsible for developing and administering <clears throat> CSLB's 46 licensing and certification examinations at our eight test centers. We schedule over 44,000 exams a year and test nearly every working day. All of CSLB's licensing examinations are based on a current occupational analysis, which provides a description of construction work performed by contractors in each of those trades. We keep all of the examinations updated on a five to seven year cycle. The new C7 low voltage exam was released in December. Currently, we're working on seven exams in the occupational analysis phase and six in the item bank development phase. That's it. Are there any questions? Do any committee members have any comments? Any public comments? Okay. Moving on to agenda item F, review discussion and possible action regarding licensing reciprocity and other with other states and the use of the National Association of State Contractors Licensing Agencies, NASCLA trade exams and trade exam waivers. The committee previously discussed this item at the November 2017 meeting and requested additional information. This item is one of the licensing committee's strategic objectives to review existing reciprocity agreements and how other states handle CSLB licenses. 
In November, the committee had a presentation from the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services, OPES, about the use of NASCLA's trade exams and trade exam waivers. OPES recommended that in considering reciprocity, CSLB should evaluate the difference in the scope of practice, examination content, format, passing scores, and passing rates. OPES further recommended that if CSLB does adopt the use of NASCLA general building exam, we should one, accept that the exams are not parallel, two, maintain existing waiver regulations, three, accept the NASCLA exam only for reciprocity, and four, participate in the NASCLA occupational analysis process. The committee requested additional information specifically on how other states treat California licensees any enforcement statistics, excuse me, complaints on CSLB has received against reciprocity licensees and feedback from contractor associations. CSLB currently has limited reciprocity with three states, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Laura, will you provide some of the statistical information on those reciprocity agreements? Sure, to address one of the um, areas that the committee wanted additional information on, enforcement did research on um, the, our current licensees that have been licensed through reciprocity um, and the complaints that we've received against them and found um, reciprocity licensees are approximately 40% less likely to receive a consumer complaint than all of our other licensees. The staff recommend Recommendation is that the licensing committee direct staff to continue researching the experience requirements for general building licenses in Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Oregon, and their willingness to waive a general building trade exam for a California licensee. Staff will report its findings at the April 2018 board meeting. Do any committee members have any comments? Uh, I had one question for Laura. When you said there was 40% less likely to have a violation, what kind of numbers are you talking about? Um, so since 1998, we've had 818 licensees granted reciprocity. Um, in the last two years, 25 of those licensees have had a complaint filed against them. Um, two of those 25 resulted in a citation, and one of those two resulted in an accusation. Okay. And then there's one pending investigation. And then, so that, Overall, for our licensing population, approximately 3%, um, I believe, receive a complaint every year. Is that accurate, David? About 5%. About 5%. And how does that compare with our state, California state licensed? So then, so approximately 3% with reciprocity receive a complaint, and then of our total population, about 5% receive a okay. complaint. All right. Thank you. Is there any? I just noticed that Arkansas doesn't accept reciprocity from any state, so is that even an option for the board, or is that something that's, is that in statute, or is that in regulation, or is that something that could be negotiated? Do you guys have any information on that? Um, so there is information in the packet that kind of summarizes what, how other states treat us. I don't recall offhand if that was by statute or regulation, so we'll provide more detail at the next board meeting, um, but then certainly that would be something we'd have to consider when deciding whether to move forward if they're not going to accept our licensees because that's one of the conditions. Right. Right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Laura, would it, um, would it be possible for you to, um, sorry, I'm a visual person, so is it, is it possible for you to kind of graph that out, like co do these comparison in a chart? <laughs> so sure. So we of can the see how they compare, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do that for the next meeting. That, that would be really helpful because, you know, some of the different states have these different categories, commercial contractor, residential contractor, residential building contract, and, you know, for us non-contractors, uh, it's kind of difficult to kind of compare that to our license, uh, general contractor A or B. So I, I don't know how you can do it. It seems like every state has different categories. Uh, for example, Georgia has residential light and residential heavy. <coughs> you know, it's, uh, it's really confusing. Yeah, you do find as you research how other states license contractors, we're quite different from everyone else. And um, it's, it's hard to um, 
you know, looking for someone who's equivalent to California or even from one state to the next. They, do it, they all do it differently. And the majority of states don't license at the state level like California does. So what, what are we trying to compare? What are we trying to find with this comparison here? So we're trying to identify if these states that use the NASA general building exam, if we, if they, um, the requirements are comparable to ours, and then if they treat, if they would accept our licensees. And so if so, then do we want to extend um, reciprocity to those applicants by allowing um, us to accept the use of their NASA general building exam in place of taking our B exam? Uh, Lauren, one more question. Would they have to, to, to take a separate test for our legal side of the, you would give them a trade waiver, but on the, the legal side, would they have to test for that? Right, they would still have to take the law exam. Okay. So on the trade side, are we looking at the uh, NASCLA, NASCLA exam to see it has the similar skill sets that are required in California? Or is that another part of your analysis? So that was what we talked about at the November committee meeting. Um, and I, th I think staff determined that, uh, or recommended that we did accept it. Um, it's not so equivalent, but that it was sufficient for California standards. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay. The staff recommendation is that the licensing committee direct staff to continue researching the experience. I think I said that already, right? Can I? Um, I would uh, I would make a motion to direct staff to check into Oregon only, and not the others. Okay. So, just for consideration I mean, we talked about the North Carolina dental board case and one of the reasons why this item was placed on the agenda was in response to that Supreme Court decision so just consider the fact that you probably want to explore as many options as possible for reciprocity so you can avoid any allegations relating to the antitrust case uh, agreed so we're going to um, Go ahead with the original motion, which will be to explore all of the states mentioned. Or Can't do that. He's made a motion just to consider Oregon, but I wanted, for purposes of board or committee, excuse me, committee discussion, that you maybe want to consider the fact that you might want to have another motion that includes the other states. But the motion that's on the floor is just for Oregon right now. And it was seconded. By there was a second. Go ahead. Doesn't it have to be voted on before you can make another motion? Right, but that's what I'm putting out there for you to consider. So we're going to go with your motion, and can we have a vote? Okay. Is there any public comment on the motion to consider Oregon only for reciprocity? I just have a question. Uh, Oregon is already part of the overall study, right? Right? Yes. So why do we want to separate that out? I, for, for me and for my motion, I, uh, I feel that Oregon, because of the proximity to California, makes a lot more sense than um, our contractors would benefit as well as their contractors benefiting with reciprocity between the two states. I see no benefit to California contractors in uh, you know, Georgia and uh, Louisiana, North Carolina. Uh, they're, they're on the East Coast. What, what we have seen in California is a lot of these contractors coming, you know, uh, without saying in certain parts of the country coming into our state, contracting without licensing. Uh, taking the money, cheating employees, and heading back to their home states. I, you know, I, I just I see no benefit to us and to our to Californians by allowing uh, some contractors from the East Coast. I've tried to collect money from specifically a Georgia contractor that was in California, and had no ability to do that. I had no help from Georgia. I had no 
no one to even talk to there. So I had a very bad experience with that. But then that hold true also for Arizona, though, since they're, they're the border states with California? Proximity was a lot better. It was a lot easier for me to, you know, to get there, to find the right person, to do those sort of things. Um, I have a question, mostly information about Oregon. You mentioned that. And the other states, um, I'm, I'm thinking about what we had last year, all these disasters in the last two or three years, and contractors usually float from one state to the next where demand is, and a lot of time it leaves our state sort of weak on contractors. Um, I don't know if they have a special um, brew that when under disaster they waive brews to come in and help us out or what, but if you do it just for Oregon, are we hurting ourselves if we need contractors to come in to help us build? Uh, that's all, and you know more about that than I do. So you can answer that. You know, I'm I'm a Californian. I see we have plenty of contractors and, and uh, people that can do that. But we do have reciprocity with, with Nevada, uh, Utah, and Arizona. And uh, uh, if we get reciprocity with Oregon, which is a, a very heavily licensed state, I think that would you know, cover us pretty well. Uh, the Western United States is, you know, because of the proximity of those states, I, I think that those contractors would be uh, apt to go back and forth, you know, it, I, I just don't see any benefit to our contractors from having some of these deep south contractors coming to our state. Yeah. I don't see us going there. Madam Chair, may I add a, um, a friendly amendment to add Oregon to the list of recommendation? It's it on is, the, the motion is, the motion oh, is just and he wants to, to just do Oregon only. Just Oregon only. I think Christy has a comment. But I just wanted to kind of for your consideration. Um, the idea for allowing this reciprocity is simply to get those people that typically would not be licensed, licensed. So you have jurisdiction over them. And so if they do do something to a California consumer, there's recourse in this state, and you don't have to go to Georgia to do any kind of recourse. What would happen then is you would take your action, they would have a record, and maybe Georgia would be interested after that because you've got a track record, an investigative case that's been proven, a violation in this state. That would be reported out to the licensing entity in the other state. So the benefit to having people that would come here, like they potentially already do, is that they would actually have a license that you could potentially um, have jurisdiction over them in this state and that's what we're goal our goal is to protect the consumers in this state and I just would like to put that out there because that is typically why um, other boards in the department consider reciprocity with other states because they're already coming to California for the work and the population here thank, thank you, you. And well, along those same lines, those same contractors can come here with knowledge and, and skills and abilities and a background that they could take our test, and, and that would be just fine. And we don't need reciprocity if they want to move here or, or set up an office here and be a California contractor. Correct. Take our test. Chrissy. Right. So just to follow up on that, um, you know, the Supreme Court decision indicates that if you can make the determination, and, and you're, you're correct, this is just to determine whether it's equivalent, it has to be the same or greater. If it's not the same or greater, you can't grant reciprocity under the statute. So if it's the same and you require them to take the test, then the problem is that you've set up a barrier that in the potentially could be considered uh, problematic from an antitrust perspective. So. I would just suggest to take a hard look at the facts and see if they're the same or greater. If they're not, then you shouldn't because it wouldn't meet the statutory requirements for allowing reciprocity. Can I, can I ask one more question? We are considering Oregon, so we're moving along those paths. It's not illegal for us in any way or violation of interstate commerce to take these one at a time. Is that a correct statement? That's true. There you go. Yes, Nancy. 
So just so that I'm clear, um, right now the direction is just to have staff do the research, bring us the information and this to the committee here and then this is gonna go forward to the board. So it's not like there's a decision being made, it's just bringing the information forward, it's allowing us to show that we did look into these other um, groups and keeping consumer protection as our main goal, um, considering the other information you're putting forth. I, I hear what you're saying um, and I agree with that, but I think in the best interest, it might be best that we do bring this other information forward. We're not making like the major decision, it's just, to bring that information forward really is what we're saying. Correct, so again, the current motion is to look at reciprocity for the state of Oregon only. Can we get a roll call vote? Marla Richardson. Could, could before that, um, board member Simpson, uh, I, I guess since it's already part of the motion to study Oregon as part of this whole packet of research. I, I still don't understand why you want to bring in Oregon a, a separate, is it a different study you want for Oregon or? No, not at all. Because it's part of, of this motion here that we're, staff recommendation is. Yeah, no, my only, uh, uh, I wanted to do it one at a time instead of all these states and, and let's see how, what happens. Uh, we already have it with Nevada and Utah and uh, Arizona. Let's, uh, I'm okay with bringing Oregon into the fold. I'm not ready to, you know, so seven other states have Ross Presley with California. So you're saying... And then you're, the, this this is, is, the Oregon is part of the study, yes. Yeah, but you don't, you want us to forget the staff recommendation and just do Oregon? Is that where you're coming from? Correct. I just want to bring uh, the recommendation was for Oregon as well as these other states. That's I'm right. saying, why don't we just start with one and see how that I goes? Got you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Any oh, any comment? public comment? Okay. Good morning, Richard Markson. Um, I think my clients would agree with Ms. Springer's recommendation that. This is only a study, uh, staff has already committed a, a fair amount of work to uh, look at the appropriateness of expanding the state's current reciprocity uh, standard uh, to other states. Uh, so I, I think the appropriate thing for the committee to do would be to uh, let the full board uh, consider the staff's report at a future meeting. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Marla Richardson. No. Dave Diaz? Yeah. Pastor Herrera? No. Ed Lang? Nay. Frank Shetter? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Nancy Springer? No. Four to three with a no vote. Can I go back to the original motion? Thank you. All right. So again, the original motion was the staff recommendation of the licensing committee direct staff to continue researching the experience requirements for general building licenses in Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Oregon, and their willingness to waive a general building trade exam for the California licensee. Staff will report on its findings at the April 2018 board meeting. Can we get a motion? No, move. Thank Second. you. Laura, roll call, please. Marla Richardson? Aye. Dave Diaz? Aye. Pastor Herrera? Aye. Ed Lang? Aye. Frank Shutter? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Nancy Springer? Aye. Motion has been approved. Any recommendations the committee approves today will be moved to the full board for action at the April board meeting. Moving on to agenda item G, review, discussion, and possible development of an Arborist Health and Safety Certification Program. In August 2017, CSLB staff met with members of the tree care industry who expressed concerns with the current classification structure, accidents and fatalities, and prevailing wages. At the December 2017 board meeting, 
Letters of support were received and testimony was provided by members of the tree care industry. The majority of public comment was centered on worker safety. The board referred this matter to the licensing committee for further review and discussion to determine if there is a need to create a new C specialty license for tree service. Since the board meeting, staff have had further discussions with members of the tree service industry on ways to address worker safety. Based on these discussions, staff is recommending development of a certification program instead of creating a new C specialty license. Staff recommendation is that the licensing committee recommend to the full board directing CSLB staff to meet with representatives from the California Occupational Safety and Health to develop an arborist health and safety certification program and in the interim hold informational meetings with various stakeholders. Is there any committee comments? Marla? Yes. Uh, to staff or whoever's coming up with this recommendation. Um, the certification, so that would this be something that the employee or whatever would have on them at the time when they're cutting a tree out down, or how, how would that work? It would be the same as like the C10, the electrical certification? Um, that's a good question. I think the details would have to be worked out. I think when we made the staff recommendation, we envisioned it sort of working like the asbestos certification or the hazardous certification. It's something any licensee can apply apply for, pass the exam, and apply to their license. So it's going to be only on the licensee. It's not going to be like the C-10 where the employees need to be certified. Uh, in my previous life, when I was going through high school, I worked in the summer doing this, and <laughs> I, I would want the employees to be certified, honestly, if they're going to be up in a tree, because it's a very, very dangerous job. And that's just my opinion. So. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, unfortunately, CSLB itself, we don't have jurisdiction over the employees, and so the, okay. the electrical certification was done, you know, separate from CSLB um, and requires a state agency partner. In that case, it's DLSC, so. Okay, then I make the motion for the staff recommendation. Thank you. Does any member... Sorry. Oops, I'm sorry. Is there any member of the public that has I comment? Did you vet this uh, recommendation with the association versus, I guess they were, last time we heard them, they were wanting to have a license versus right. certification? We did not, but I think some of them are here today. <laughs> well, I, I did speak to Pat Mahoney, so I did talk to Pat about it. Yeah, so the problem that they're right now. The problem that exists right now in the tree industry is we have a lot of people out there, including demolition landscape maintenance contractors, that are allowed to perform tree maintenance without any experience in the tree maintenance business. So they can take the, the uh, if you pass the tree license, you have to show that you have four years experience working in the tree industry. If you become a C27 landscape contractor, you don't have to have any tree experience running a tree business and running a tree business being a tree trimming contractor like you said is very dangerous so we're asking we're we're seeing the rate of accidents off the chart our let me go back my name is pat mahoney president of west coast arborist nearly a thousand employees working for public agencies we're a union signatory with the liuna labor union but what happens the uh, the workers comp rates are extremely high it's a real unfair playing field because you have landscape c27 licensed contractors can do the same work pay a 25 percent of the workers comp and they're putting guys up in trees they have no experience some of them do but most you know good part don't the employees don't have any and they're getting hurt causing our rates to skyrocket with the workers comp so we like the certification for the company pro uh, thing that you're talking about we'd like to work with you towards making that a, a good program i don't know if you could continue with both of them to have you know somewhere down the road to have not a limited specialty license like the d49 is now but a regular C license for tree maintenance down the road. I know it's, it takes three to four years. 
so that somebody that passes that at least has to say, I've been in the tree business for four years. Right now you've got guys doing this work that haven't been. So if we could do both would be great. If we just, you know, if we end up with just a certification for the, con for the uh, people doing that type work is fantastic. But we think we really need, you know, down the road need both of them because we continue these landscape, the landscape contractors see this as an avenue to, to make an unfair, you know, they can do the work, pay less prevailing wage, less insurance, and qualify. So I thank you. Look forward to working, uh, the association and myself and our company working with you on the program. Thank you. Is there additional public comment? Good morning, board. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Sean Lopez. I spoke at the last meeting as well, and uh, I've been attending these pretty regularly. Uh, I'm an investigator uh, in Southern California uh, for the craft of tree maintenance, tree trimming, uh, line clearance, things of that nature. Uh, I would like to show my support for a new C license. Uh, I do think a certification for a company is a good step, but I would like to push for an official license just for tree maintenance. Uh, for these reasons. Uh, I've noticed a lot of you know, agencies, cities, counties, um, and C27 landscape licenses uh, and contractors, they're able to essentially hide tree work within large public works projects. Uh, the way they're doing this, um, the C27 contractor and the agency, um, they know they can you know, do tree work and so can companies like West Coast Arborists and other, you know, tree specialty contractors, they can all do the same work. Um, however, when a C27 landscape company comes in, offers a much lower price for tree work, uh, they're winning all the bids. Uh, and the same guys that are, you know, mowing your lawn and, you know, trimming your hedges and picking up garbage are the same guys going up in palm trees 100 feet in the air. Uh, what I notice from investigating landscape companies and tree maintenance companies, a lot of these companies, if you look at their workers' comp history, uh, safety of course, every year, every two years, they're switching companies. The reason why they're switching companies is because they will have an accident, uh, their workers are classified as landscape maintenance, the insurance company finds out it was a tree accident, they drop their policy, and they just bounce from company to company. That's what I'm seeing. Uh, I know I think it was a very good step to investigate and target uh, tree licenses. Uh, and you guys found a, a lot of success and a lot of violations. What I would suggest uh, would be to target some of the C27 license holders. They're the ones that I'm seeing the issues with. Uh, C27 landscapers, they can bid the work and they do bid the work. When I look into those companies, I find a lot of tree work and no tree maintenance workers, no certified workers, nothing. I think there would also be a lot of success if we targeted the C27s. What this would do, um, you know, it would set a standard in the industry. There's only a handful of C27 landscape licenses, uh, contractors that do large public works projects. These are three to 10 to 16 year projects for agencies. Uh, once we, you know, find one or two and make an example of them, that would, you know, significantly clear up the industry. That's what I've found just by spreading your, your good graces, your good words, your important notices that you're putting out, the clarifications, those are helping the tree industry, industry tremendously. Um, if we can do that and kind of target the landscape maintenance industry as well, that will help divide the trees and the landscape and uh, the specialty labor that does come with uh, tree maintenance. Um, and lastly, uh, we are, my organization, the Center for Contract Compliance, we have tremendous amount of data on multiple contractors, crafts, licenses. We can make your jobs a lot easier, especially when it comes to enforcement. And you know, we would love to share that information with you so we could work together uh, and save some of your data collection time. You know, we have a lot of it. We have systems that we can share with you that will show you a targeted contractor that's got violations for the last 5, 10, 15 years. Thank you, sir. Your time yeah. is up. Thank you. I, I would just differentiate between uh, the lawn maintenance folks and trim hedging folks who are exempt from licensure and then the C27 licensees who demonstrate four years of experience in uh, structural land maintenance or structural alterations to outside lands. 
Thank you. Hold on. Did my motion ever get seconded? No. Okay. I will, when, just to do staff recommendation, but I will actually want to amend it, but if it never got seconded, I don't even have to worry about it. I can uh, amend it. I just want to, instead of uh, saying down here, uh, in the interim hold informational meetings with various stakeholders, I, said, I think we should add to pursue possibility of a separate license. Both, like, to look at the certification well, no, the sort of, uh, sorry, through the chair, but um, yeah, the certification still d go there, but then continue to pursue the license because I, like I said, I worked in the industry and it is a very dangerous in industry and I don't want somebody that just, you know, is uh, trimming a bush one day going up into a hundred foot tree and start cutting on it or trimming it. And so that's the issue. And I... I take it a little bit personally that way just because I worked in it, so. Thank you, David. Public comment? Yes, my name's Larry Abernathy. I'm uh, uh, with the Davy Tree Company, Davy Tree Surgery Company, and uh, we hold both licenses, both landscaping and uh, tree services. Um, I've been with the company since 1969, so I got about 49 years in the industry, and um, uh, I totally support your motion, or, you know, or I and I, our, my company will support in that uh, progressing to a C. Um, and so, as a matter of fact, uh, some of us in the industry have been talking. We were kind of the certificate uh, or certification was kind of, a, I think, a good approach. So uh, I may be getting ahead of the, the, the pack here a little bit, but uh, I actually put together some ideas that you might want to consider as just a brainstorming, like a starting point. Um, so I, what I was thinking was is sort of similar to some apprentice programs where you have to earn a certain number of points and get them done. I would uh, suggest that there's a lot of good industry um, organizations in the tree industry. There's the uh, International Society of Arboriculture, uh, ISA. There's the tree care industry, TCIA. They, they, they both uh, educate you in uh, uh, how to properly prune trees and, and how to work safely. So with that, I, I would just like to submit, uh, you know, some ideas that, um, you know, would, would be good for a certification uh, for the owner or the applicant that would be the RME, at least the minimum. And so I classified it in, you know, like points earned for the education, the safety, and uh, their tree work experience. So with that, I'd just like to submit it and, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy, another mini comment? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, a point of clarification maybe. So is the motion necessary? Because the board already made the recommendation to look into the, the licensing back in December. I thought it was referred to committee for discussion. Am I incorrect? Yeah, the board referred to the committee to kind of further explore the issue. And the staff recommendation was the certification as an alternative to creating a C license. It oh. wasn't the intention to do both, but certainly so we we'll do whatever the committee okay. directs. I just want to make sure we're. So we're. Do we get a second for. We do oh, have sorry. A Hi, real quick. My name is Sandra Jardy. I'm the executive director for the California Landscape Contractors Association, otherwise known as the C27s. First, I want to bring up some very important differentiations, the first of which Michael Jemnetsky made for us, which is there's a vast differentiation between some of the businesses that you see going out and doing some weed abatement. We reference it sometimes in the industry. You hear the vernacular of mow, blow, and go. <laughs> <laughs> Mo blow and go. The people that you see twice a month coming onto a property, they tend to it and they move on. The C27 landscape contractor's license is exactly that. It is a solid, expansive contractor's license. Outdoor kitchens, irrigation, plumbing, and yes, some tree work with a caveat. That tree work has to be taken care of at 15 feet or less. Now, many of our members do also hold the tree service designation, otherwise, as you know it, as the C61 slash D49, including some very large companies that operate on projects that you would, re you would very much recognize, Google, Facebook, Beverly Hills Hotel, etc. 
We suggest that the committee move forward with the staff recommendation. There is a lot of things that we want to see happen in this regard. And the very first one is exactly that, worker safety. Nobody should have to become injured or die because they were maintaining a tree, whether that's 10 feet up, 20 feet up, or 100 feet up in the air. By and large, some of the citations that we had seen relative to the concerns in this regard have administrative remedies through other agencies. Nobody should be fudging on their workers' compensation quotes. Part of the challenge that I know a lot of our C27s have with workers' compensation is the fact that one of the largest insurers left the marketplace because of their own concerns relative to tree work. To take this even to further, it's not just the contractor that has an issue if they didn't properly disclose the amount of tree workers that they have on their crew and an incident occurs. But if there's enough claims, the actual underwriting company stops working with the agency and brokers that sold those policies. We've seen that started to happen in the marketplace. We have multiple remedies. If you fudge on your workers' comp and you're caught, Department of Insurance and the local district attorney's office are more than happy to take those pieces up, and they have. Relative to doing public works projects and fudging and letting people do things that are out of their classification, there was a memo at the end of October clarifying from the Department of Industrial Relations about exactly that issue. We want safety. We think it's imperative. It's imperative not just for the workers, it's imperative for the projects that they work on. And we definitely recommend that this committee move forward with looking at this certification efforts. And we definitely look forward to being involved in addition with other stakeholders like ISA, TCIA, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Can we go forward with the motion or do I need to repeat it? Can, to be clear, the motion is stating that oh, we're doing both. We're, lo we're looking into the licensing, possible additional licensing. Um, a new license and also the safety Correct. certification program. Correct. Okay. Yes. I just want to clarify that this is just to explore the idea. You can't actually do it until you've uh, made regulatory or statutory changes, which requires further implementation. A minimum time frame for regulatory change right now is about two years. So this would not be a motion to implement those new licenses or classifications or certifications, but simply to explore, take information, well, hearings and workshops on it, and further develop a concept that, you know, the board could maybe look at in the future. Thank you. Will the vote, please? Marla Richardson? Aye. Dave Diaz? Aye. Pastor Herrera? Aye. Ed Lang? Aye. Frank Shetter? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Aye. Nancy Springer. Aye. Motion approved. Moving to agenda item H, review discussion and possible action on license classification authorized to install energy storage systems. Uh, we're going to page 93. Over the last year, the electrical industry has raised concerns about classifications other than electrical installing energy storage systems. There are currently several classifications that can install these systems depending on the specific circumstances. Letters received from the National Electrical Contractors Association, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, the Coalition of California Utility Employees, and the Electrical Safety Foundation International have been provided to committee members and are available at the sign-in table over there in the back. Again, just to repeat what board member Nancy Springer said earlier, we did not receive these uh, prior to today, so we have not personally been able to review the letters. The staff recommendation is that the licensing committee direct staff to conduct public meetings to determine if the A, general engineering, B, general engine, excuse me, general building, C4, boiler, hot water heating and steam fitting, C10 electrical, C20 warm air heating, ventilation, ventilating and air conditioning, C36 plumbing, C46 solar, and C53 swimming pool classification should be precluded from installing an energy storage system in a standalone contract or when included in the installation of a solar system. After the public or work group meetings conclude, staff will report any findings to the full board to determine if policy, regulatory, or statutory changes are needed. Are there any committee member comments? 
Can I make a motion now, or do you want to wait a comment? Uh, let's see if there's any public comments. Any public comments? Hello again, Bernadette Del Quiro, Executive Director of the California Solar and Storage Association. I mentioned that I would uh, give you a little bit of background on our name change. Um, it's been about a year and a half in the making. It's not easy to change a 40-year-old organization's name, uh, but we have done it. And it is um, simply a reflection of both our 40-year um, history, our current realities, and the future direction of the solar industry, which is um, to start. We've always been uh, installing solar paired uh, systems with storage. Uh, we currently do it today. In fact, 70, over 70% 70 of the storage systems that were installed through the state's self-generation incentive program through the PUC were installed by our membership. We have over 500 company members throughout the state of California. Over 250 are contractors. Over 100 of those contractors are C46 license holders. We represent the whole gamut of the industry up and down the state. And uh, we have been and, and will continue to be installing solar, solar PV systems paired with storage, as we have for over 30 years through um, the state licensing uh, licensing requirements. Um, I actually have a number of member companies here today um, who can elaborate further on our comments um, about this uh, motion. Um, we uh, look forward to participating uh, with and, and speaking with the CSLB um, about this issue. Um, I would like to actually ask um, if it's public information who there's a at the very beginning of the background, there's a mention of um, staff met with some electrical contractors um, in preparation for this um, whole agenda item. Is it possible to find out who, who that meeting was with and if any C46 contractors were part of the conversation? Sure, I actually don't recall offhand, but I'd be happy to provide that as a okay. follow-up to you. And okay, then we can that'd be great. And you know, if if staff are interested, we would love to be able to con have equal time uh, to to explore this issue a little more deeply um, before some formal public process. I brought some annual reports um, that just elaborate a little bit further about our association. Um, uh, I actually have a couple of questions for Wendy Balvance, um, if she's available to to answer them about the licensing and and the testing requirements. If that's possible, Wendy. Thank you. So, um, so Wendy, thank you so much. Um, the, 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 the motion, it looks like, or the topic covers a number of licenses, but the um, background information really just is about the C46 and the C10. I'm wondering if you can uh, just elaborate a little bit for us um, uh, which of those two licenses um, uh, more, most consistently has the most number of questions related to, on the test, related to uh, solar and storage? Can you disclose that kind of information, or is that oh. confidential about how many questions relate to what issues on the test? It is absolutely public information. Okay. It's I in our validation check. reports. <laughs> the main part of the validation report is it's a summary of the occupational analysis, so we are required to do that. It is totally public information. Thank you. Good to check. Um, we have current occupational analyses for both trades, and the C46 solar trade, because of its scope, covers a great deal of photovoltaic, and part of that is energy storage. And when we go back in our validation reports over the decades, we see that energy storage was part of the solar industry, the solar exam for all these many years. I do only have documentation through 2002. But um, it only started being in the electrical occupational analysis and then on the electrical exam starting in, I have this data, 2008, I believe. Because the solar industry covers, all the questions are covering thermal and photovoltaic. It used to be mainly thermal, and over the years, photovoltaic has grown and grown and grown. So the exam as it stands now, there are 13 questions on the 100 item exam that particularly pertain to thermal. All the rest is photovoltaic friendly, and a good portion of those, at least seven on every version of the exam, has to be on energy storage. The C10 exam covers a huge range of electrical activities. A small portion of it 
is photovoltaic. A smaller portion of that is energy storage. From merely the occupational analysis point of view, energy storage is covered more by solar. And the exams that we give each day reflect that. Thank you. Um, one last question on this. Uh, um, how long has the C10 uh, test covered um, solar uh, storage, um, specifically solar PV and storage, um, for how many years? And uh, as a, a kind of a result Point of, of order, uh, Madam Chair, are, are we using a CSLB agent to answer questions on public comment? Is that, is that what this is? Well, I mean, the public's allowed to ask anything for anything related to the agenda, and things that are not on the agenda would be, should be discussed outside the meeting. So I realize it relates to the motion that's on the table, so that's why I haven't said anything. But I think at some point, I thought there was a motion. Okay. I, I apologize. But relating to the classification question, um, the energy storage question, it, it is potentially related, but I do believe there's a five minute limit. Yeah, it is. So. And your question? How long has the C10 license included questions related to solar and storage? The C10 exam as it stands now does not have to have any uh, energy storage questions on it. It might. There are photovoltaic questions on the exam. I believe it's 13, 10. Um, but they do not have to cover energy storage. There are some questions in the bank that cover energy storage, but they're not forced on each exam version. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. I, 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 have, a follow, I have a question. What, what are the basic requirements for a C46 license to stand for, for uh, the test? Four years journey level experience, just like any exam. Like what? Pardon? At what? That what would be crap? more of a licensing question. Uh, I mean, it's four years of experience, the journeyman level, or um, within the, the trade described in the classification, which I think is in the background paper here. Um, you with me? So a C46 contractor. Oh. oh, on page 94? Thank you. Would you like me to read it? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, installs, modifies, maintains, and repairs thermal and photovoltaic solar energy systems. A licensee classified in this section shall not undertake or perform building or construction trades, crafts, or skills, except when required to install a thermal or photovoltaic solar energy system. So you're saying someone who sets panels on a roof for four years is qualified to be a C-46 contractor? Me personally? Yeah. Four years of, of just setting panels on a roof is qualified to be I can't C46. speak to the well, breadth. Just said that. I can't, I can't <laughs> speak to the breadth of experience and how it is perceived in the licensing division. That's how it's perceived. Yes, Nancy. I have a question. So you were talking about an occupational analysis on C40. When's the last time you did an occupational analysis on the C10? The C10 is in the process right now. We've already begun it. Okay. Should come out this year in 2018. Yes. If I can make a recommendation, um, part of the recommendation is that we'd be holding some public workshops, um, which you all would be invited to. So I think it might be best to have a discussion in that forum. Just my recommendation. I agree, and that's a part of the motion. So do we? Well, I'm, I'm asking for David to go ahead well, with the motion. My motion's not going to be anything what the staff recommends. Okay. Any more public comment? Good morning, Tom Ensel on behalf of the California Utility Employees. The members of the California Utility Employees, also known as Q, represent employees of most of the electric utilities in California, both public and private. And I'm here today to join in support of the letters submitted by all three of the California investor-owned electric utilities, PG&E, SDG&E, and SCE, to support action by the CSLB to clarify that C46 solar contractors are not authorized to install energy storage systems. 
This is an urgent issue for the utilities and the utility employees because a CSLB staff person recently stated in a letter to the CPUC her interpretation that C46 contractors could perform this work. And this resulted in a change in CPUC policy on what contractors could perform energy storage work receiving uh, utility incentives, including the SGAIP utility incentives that were just, that were just referenced. I mean, a lot of CalSEA members get those incentives, but they only, can, uh, up till uh, this change last month, they could only get those if they were C10 contractors or A or B contractors. Um, the utilities opposed this change and are asking the committee to provide clarification today. The scope of work allowed to be performed by a specific contractor classifi classification is not set by the test. It's set by state statute and by the CSLB regulations. Um, and where those regulations are unclear, it's up to the licensing committee to provide its interpretation. Section 832.46, uh, of the Title 16 expressly states that C46 contractors shall not undertake or perform building or construction trades uh, or crafts or skills except when required to install a thermal or photovoltaic solar energy system. That restriction is even more limited than the general restriction on the scope of specialty contractors, which limits the scope to work that is incidental or supplemental to the performance of the work. By adopting a more restrictive scope of work, um, the intent was clearly to keep the scope of C46 work narrow. And now, obviously, you know, there are questions on the test to do energy storage, but that's because, uh, about re 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 uh, pertaining to energy storage, but that's because they need to connect at uh, times to energy storage systems. But that doesn't mean they can install the system. You, they also need to know about roofing enough to connect uh, rooftop solar uh, panels to the roof without disturbing the integrity of the roof, but that doesn't mean they can install the roof itself. Uh, so just the fact that there are questions on the test pertaining to energy storage, does that um, change the scope of the license? Uh, these systems, energy storage systems are neither required to install PV energy systems, nor are they incidental to the installation of PV systems. They have unique functions and, and uh, are uh, um, subject to um, their own separate installation and safety standard and code requirements that must be fo followed, and they require different skills to install, and they pose unique safety risks that, that really shouldn't be underestimated. The, uh, these systems are also, th th they're not cookie cutter. They vary widely in type, size, and technology. Um, technology is constantly changing. And these systems are not just a s couple small batteries. You know, lar large commercial systems, some of these systems are now hitting the 10 to 20 megawatt level behind the meter here in California. These are essentially small utility scale systems. Under CSLB's staff interpretation, even these systems could be installed by C46 contractors as long as there's a solar component. Improperly installed energy storage systems pose a risk to workers, emergency responders, and the general public. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. Okay. Just to, just to um, uh, summarize. Our, our uh, time is up, sir. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Another public comment? Thank you very much, Pete Gregson, Advanced Power. Frank, I'd like to address your question about C46 doing roof installs. Can you speak in the mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I kind of mumbled, so I'll, I'll try to be better. Absolutely not. I hope that clarifies that. So let's look at how we talk about energy storage. That's a, that's a new word all of a sudden. Energy storage, I think we can say, can be many, many facets. And you can look at hydrogen as energy storage. But we as C46s have had solar-powered electrolyzers for 20 years. You can look at compressed gas as energy storage. We have solar power compressors. We do lots of solar powered pond irrigation with compressors. You can look at pump, pumping water systems up a hill to bring the water down during peak times. We have solar water pumps that can produce water over 60 gallons a minute. When you want to look at an energy storage system based on batteries, look at 690. We're one of the only trades that specifically say we do battery installations. When it comes to battery systems, we're the ones who invented it. And the issue nowadays is everybody thinks all we do is grid tie systems. That's a crock. What I look at is what you call off-grid systems, I call primary power systems.
We have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of primary power systems in California that don't have utility power. We've installed these systems for over 40 years. I've done islands for the Army. That's first time since World War II they can cut the generator off. I think the issue comes down to two, the primary power system versus the backup power system. When you look at the difference of C10s and C46s, we do primary power systems. When you look at C10s, they do backup power systems. They do incidental power systems for the phase shift to get the automatic generator to start. I put in systems that use inverters that are designed primarily for the nuclear power industry, for refineries. I'm the only one who uses those inverters with lithium ion battery banks. There's tens of hundreds of these inverters in the world protecting nuclear power plants. But I'm the only one in the world using those inverters with lithium ion battery banks on primary power system and we're running, yes, utility companies, we're running villages. And why can't we do that? Because the utility companies know where we're going. We're turning them off. And if you don't allow us as contractors and you start labeling us as we don't know what we're doing, people like me are going to fight you. And we're going to fight you in court because we do know what we're doing. This is the same game that was played a few years ago that you all are aware of when the C and you can see I'm getting agitated. <laughs> when the C10 started complaining about we're a bunch of idiots and we need to hire C10 to do the point of common coupling. When in fact the rules at that time demanded that we change the service interests of any commercial application. And then the roofers jumped on board because we were too Sir, dumb to do roofs. Sir, your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional public comment. Madam Chair, members, Eddie Bernacki on behalf of the National Electrical Contractors Association. I want to first thank the registrar, the board, and staff for bringing this forward. This is an issue that we've been looking forward to getting some clarity on for over two and a half years. Uh, NECA represents our members are both C46 contractors, C10 contractors, and in many cases those contractors carry both licenses. You know, it's been our long-standing belief when we read the clear reading of the regulation that it is very limited, that it limits the C46 contractor to thermal and photovoltaic installations. If you read that, it says a solar contractor installs, modifies, maintains, repairs thermal and photovoltaic solar energy systems. A license classified in this section shall not undertake or perform building or construction trades, crafts, or skills except when required, when required to install a thermal photovoltaic solar energy system. An energy system is not required to install a photovoltaic solar system. Energy storage systems are clearly separate systems. They, have, they can be paired with the PV system. They can also be paired with other energy generation systems, wind, biomass, or connected directly to the grid. Um, you know, so that's why our members, when they are doing, when they do both PV solar installations and energy battery energy storage <laughs> systems, they carry a C10 license because that license ensures that you have the proper knowledge and expertise in electrical theory and a background on the National Electrical Code and the Fire Code to properly install those systems. You know, so the board has clearly put out their, their opinion that a C46 contractor cannot install an energy storage system as a standalone system. But they have not, but they've put out conflicting uh, interpretations of the, that the C46 can install those systems when connect, being paired with a photovoltaic system. They have, we've had, we were looking for clarity and we think it's important to get that. Uh, you know, the charge of the board obviously is to protect consumers. It's also to provide regulatory clarity to the licensees. And we would urge this committee to make the determination. I'll just, I'll just close with this and leave you with this. There is nothing prohibiting a C40 since licensee who wants to install energy, install energy storage systems um, from attaining a C10 license and showing that they're qualified to perform that work. So uh, I'll leave you with those comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Additional public comment. R Richard Markson for Western Electrical Contractors Association. We support the staff recommendation. Thank you. 
Uh, Madam Chair, members, Mike Monaghan on behalf of the California State Association of Electrical Workers. First of all, I'd like to align my remarks uh, with uh, Mr. Enslow representing the utility employees and Mr. Bernacchi representing the electrical contractors. As energy storage systems evolve, and this is, it's been going on for a lot of years, but it's certainly evolving now. It's getting more and more into our electrical solutions. It seems pretty obvious to me, and certainly supported by the uh, utilities and their letters that they sent in this week, that there are safety issues involved with uh, energy storage systems. There are risks and hazards that need to be addressed. And as these systems more and more are being interconnected with the IOU's distribution system, it seems obvious to me, on behalf of my electrical workers, that they should be done by C10 contractors using electricians. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Janine Cotter. I'm a C46 contractor uh, based in San Francisco. Um, we started actually with electrical storage as part of the PV systems, as one of the gentlemen noticed. And the growth of PV has predominantly been around grid tied systems using the grid as a battery, essentially. Um, and in Hawaii, where the growth of grid tied systems has gotten um, very, um, a bigger part of the electrical distribution, um, it is now required to have a battery in order to install a solar system. Um, that is a requirement because you're not allowed to export. Um, and that's where we're going in California. Now, um, C46 has always had storage. Um, there is DC coupled storage. And on the DC side, that is an integrated one inverter with a solar electric system. Um, there's AC coupled. Uh, there are, if the board were, if the licensing committee were to take a decision um, on this today, as was recommended uh, by um, the utility workers, that would have significant unintended consequences because we have systems out there that are DC coupled. We have systems out there that are AC coupled where um, they're, they're being, they're part of and an integral part of a solar electric system. And under the consumer protection requirements that have been established for net energy metering, we as contractors are required to have a 10-year warranty. Now, if we're not, if we're not allowed to maintain or um, uh, control our systems that we have installed um, or protect the work that we have done because somebody else gets to come in and work on those systems, how are we to protect the consumer and how are we to, to protect our work? Um, and I think that that's something that should be studied before we make a rash decision. So thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment? Hello, my name is Gary Gerber. I'm uh, a C46 as well as a B license contractor. I've been a B license since 1976, 326-203. Um, I want to add to what Janine has been talking about. I, I also want to clarify uh, on the comment about, uh, well, just C C46 are just putting panels on the roof, and that's all we do. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the, the majority of the systems that we installed uh, starting from about 1998 through 2004 were all battery-based storage systems. That's all we did. Um, it was all DC coupled. I have yet to find a C10 licensed contractor willing to even touch a DC coupled battery. They won't do it. They're not interested in it. Even today on our PW work that we do uh, throughout the state, <clears throat> When we approach the, the C10 licensees who are doing the electrical wiring for the building, the inside wiremen, they don't want to be outside. <laughs> they want to be inside. They don't want to be on the roof. They don't want to touch the DC wiring at all. 
uh, in the solar system. So they, there's an admission by the C-10s that we deal with day in and day out that they don't want that work and they're not qualified to do it. And they know it. Um, they're not tested on it, as has been already talked about. Uh, we had extensive testing in the C-46 from f for the entire time it's been in existence. So the C-46s are the ones that have actually been trained and tested in the use of storage, <coughs> battery storage. And just wanted to make sure that that was very clear. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Ted Bavin. I've been a uh, licensed C-46 for 31 years. And the idea that somebody puts panels on the roof for four years and they are a C-46 is ridiculous. They have to have supervisory work uh, for the entire jobs and must pass a test. I mean, that goes without saying. And it's clear from Wendy's testimony that uh, C-46s have had more uh, experience and, and more questions on the test the entire time it's existed. When I took my license in 86, there were questions on battery storage because those are the kind of jobs we were doing back then, off-grid battery storage systems. We've been the ones developing the battery storage industry, um, the, the backup power. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s with off-grid systems and continuing through the 90s until recently with backup power systems. Thousands of battery systems have been installed, all by C-46s. Why now do these entities want to remove C-46s? Clearly, suddenly, they see either they see that there's jobs to be had, or they are the traditional enemies of the solar industry wanting to slow it down. You know, look at who the letters are from. This is what I see. Um, some may be misinformed on the high level of experience of solar contractors, but. That's what I see. I think uh, C-46s are far more qualified than C-10s. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm uh, 572240. Been a C-46 contractor, uh, owner of companies and and all the largest companies and been involved with all the largest companies in the United States and in Canada. Uh, love the comment, Frank. So I think you can even install this. It's, this is a battery system, okay? There's a half of a kilowatt hour, plug and play. Uh, and that's what all the UL listed products pretty much come today. Uh, back when we first started doing this, we'd buy the big old weather guard tubs and put batteries in them. We don't do that anymore. So <laughs> they're all, uh, you know, approved systems. I'm with uh, JLM uh, Energy Systems. We do uh, anywhere from a half of a kilowatt hour to a megawatt systems. They all, uh, the same conductors that plug to those, the other end con uh, connects to our inverters. So everything we're already doing. Uh, I have over, you know, probably seven to 9,000 installations between, you know, PV, pool solar, hot water, everything. And, you know, we, when I look at this, when I'm reading all this, you know, interesting talking points that have been passed around to all these places, it seems like, like the last couple of years of elections, you know, a lot of false narratives. So, I mean, we are, and the C-46 is way more qualified, in our opinion, because we know construction. We have to build stuff. We have, we have to know the codes. We do, you know, structures. We do everything. So, and in every, so we know plumbing, we know roofing, we know structure, what we know. Uh, you ever seen a solar heart unit? That was my family from 1981, so, and my own company. So that thing is, you know, a thousand pounds, so we have to do all the bracing. And every one of those have electrical connecting to them. So, so our whole point is, is, you know, I, when we're looking at this and looking at the, you know, the, all these great letters that I'm reading here and the narratives that are used, there's so much falsehoods in there. It's just, you know, an over exaggerations. So of, of the industry and, you know, we would welcome, you know, open discussion, more discussion about this because uh, this is, you know, we've seen it before. They already mentioned it. It's another uh, gentleman from C46 side already mentioned it. This is a money grab. It, they're looking at a $4 billion industry over the next 12 years, okay? This is a money grab, and they're just trying to take it. 
So, <clears throat> and it's not the first time they've tried to mess with our license. If anything, I, I would petition we work out, work this out and change our C46, change the language, whatever we need to do. Because, uh, you know, by far we are the more experienced ones. So. Thank you. Additional public comment? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Harlan O'Day. I'm a, uh, also a B general contractor and a C-46 contractor, which I've been doing that since about 1979. And I would like to say that uh, the, before anything else, the, I've been doing solar, uh, specifically PV and off-grid with batteries. If you don't have batteries, there's no place to put the energy. You can't very well have photovoltaic solar power unless you have a place to put the energy. Unless the utilities there, that didn't become available until 1998 when it was approved for net metering. Prior to that, you could not couple with the utilities, so everything was batteries. And still, and still is a lot of batteries. I've done many systems that are battery powered because the utility company is so expensive to bring in power, uh, rightfully so, over a long distance. Their only option is solar and batteries, unless they want to have a generator, which they always have, and then we interface with the, the generator so you, you get that for backup if you need it. But since 1979, when I got started, uh, radio repeater sites, cell sites, all m many types of things, along with residential uh, and whatnot, have always been battery storage. And to this day, that's, it's just been a new buzzword and thing a couple of years now since the Tesla. The typical system I would do just for a house is a minimum 24 kilowatts of battery storage every single one. I've done thousands of them. And to give you an idea, the comparison, 24 kilowatts, a Tesla Powerwall is about 3 kilowatts. So, and you're going to need a lot more than one, but that's what's out there. A Sonnen battery system, they make them two to eight kilowatts, a, a German manufacturer in the U.S. for battery storage. So there's lots of options out there, but to say there is no experience in this, I do remember back in 2005 at Solar Power 2005 in Washington, D.C., where we went to talk to lawmakers about starting the solar federal tax credit, 30% tax credit. Um, who was there was the IBEW international president who, when he was pounding on this, this thing here, this lectern, uh, saying we will be in control of the photovoltaic market, whether you people out there, meaning us, like it or not, that was back in 2005. It took a long time for that to actually, where C10 started doing those kind of installations many, many more years, but that was already 12 years ago. So it, to say that, you know, we don't have the experience in it, we have lots of experience in it. Commercial, residential, doesn't matter. And I've done many systems that were in the city with 100 kilowatts of battery storage because the utility, even though it was 200 feet, still wanted $100,000 to get the power to them for whatever reason. And uh, most people don't want to spend that kind of money just so they can pay them two to 500 or $1,000 a month. So the solar fixes their cost. So anyway, I just want to, I would agree, please don't make any hasty decision on this. And by the way, I have for, last 25 years with Wendy Balfance, done at least three rewrites on the C46 to make it always relevant every five years as is required by you people. And uh, we've done our best to do that. There is much on energy storage and it always has been. And much on photovoltaics always has been. P uh, solar hot water and all that has been kind of incidental for 20 years. And it's been PV mostly. So, uh, you know, I think that it would be Thank a good you, thing. Thank you, sir. Your time is Thank up. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Shane Diller from the California Building Officials. Uh, we, we've examined this at the board level. The, at our board level, we have some concerns with the blending of the licenses. The clear regulations now call that uh, C46 is when we're doing permitting. Uh, shouldn't be permitted to work beyond systems or exclusive of systems that are not uh, related to the solar. And so just to come in to install the battery is a complication for us. Uh, we're pleased at this point that the only staff recommendation is to continue to examine this issue and to talk about it at this point if there's some uh, clarity in the language of the licensing that can, uh, can be arrived at, that would help us. And then uh, we're also going to go back and uh, work and uh, communicate with our members a little bit more to identify what uh, issues uh, this uh, uh, 
brings to local building departments and we'll have uh, a more formal position in response to you before this would uh, move on to either further committee discussion or the uh, full board. Thank you. Thank you. Are we, is there additional public comment? Sure. Um, my name's Jim Jenner. Uh, I own Fusion Power Design, I'm a C46. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, out in the field, the experience level with batteries is basically all C46. They've been doing this forever. Um, personally, I've had a lot of battery training, and I think what you're gonna find in all of the letters that are over here uh, is, is a concern for safety. And that's always been the first concern with any battery training that I've had. So it's there. That, that's, that's number one in battery training. Um, the industry is heading towards combined systems of PV with storage, whether it's a 10 kilowatt battery, small residential stuff, all the way up to huge stuff. But it's heading that way. And clearly the C46 has the, uh, has the experience. And it's all headed towards making the grid stronger and more resilient, distributed energy. Um, so, and sitting here, the idea that I had would be just to add a qualification to either a C10 or a C46 for storage. That way it's not one or the other, um, and anybody that wants to do it can do it. Just a thought, thank you. Thank you, additional public comment. Hello, my, my name is Joe Nelson from Sustainable Energy Group. I just want to elaborate on the depth and understanding of the history of where uh, our classification came from. And uh, being as pre-1998, you couldn't even connect to the utilities, all of the evolution of where we've come from has been out of using storage of some sort. So it's uh, absolutely critical that as we look forward, uh, we understand that where we came from all already had this in our evolution and that it was in incredibly critical to what, it, what we do as a Trade. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other public comment? Dave? Uh, hold on, sorry. Yes, yeah. oh, we got one more. <laughs> Almost. Good morning, uh, committee. Thank you for this time to speak to you. My name is Bernie Cotlier, and I'm here as a member of the Board of Directors of the National Advanced Technology Battery Association. We are a trade association of manufacturers uh, all over the United States, but uh, California is the number one state in terms of membership of NAPBAT. And we are obviously very concerned about this issue as battery manufacturers and makers of storage, electrical storage equipment. NAPBAT members place a very high priority on the safety of energy storage workers and the public. Most importantly, we don't want anyone injured or worse. We, uh, as manufacturers, we do a lot of our own research on safety. We've also consulted extensively with building inspectors, uh, with fire officials, and uh, with electric utilities. We've seen the letters, and we've also had separate discussions uh, with PG&E, with uh, Edison, and with SDG&E. Our own uh, positions and those of, of the organizations that we feel are the primary guarantors of safety uh, in our state uh, respectfully request that the committee make sure that energy storage installation is only done by well-qualified contractors who have deep and comprehensive knowledge and skills and experience in electrical theory and electrical code and that contractors, the only contractors that do this work, are the ones who are licensed to install energy storage systems as standalone systems. Energy, sto uh, energy storage systems may be paired with PV, but they are completely separate and independent systems. I brought with you uh, some photos that I would like to uh, share with the committee, if I could. Uh, these are from the Department of Energy website and you can look at them right now if you want, if, if you want to, they're, they're there. And these photos of energy storage systems show examples such as the Los Alamitos Energy Storage Array, 400 megawatts in uh, Long Beach, California. It, it is not connected nor it is ancillary or in any way uh, incidental to, uh, to PV storage. 
Um, this photo, the second photo, is from a UPS system, which is a backup system in Arizona. It's 12,500 kilovolt amperes. It is completely independent and separate system. The third picture is a storage system in Illinois, which, as you can see, is connected to wind. Uh, it's 31.5 megawatts. Uh, the bottom photo here is one of a, of a storage system uh, in Indiana, which is connected to a gas-fired power plant. Once again, completely separate and independent, having nothing to do uh, with PV. Uh, finally, I call your attention to the last two on these pages. One is a Duke Energy system that's 35 megawatts. It's connected to wind that has uh, nothing to do with PV. And finally, in Vernon, California, a 3.5 megawatt battery energy storage system uh, that had two functions. One is to assure the continual operation of uh, lead dust emission uh, reduction systems, which is a backup system during power outage. And secondly, the system was used in peak shaving capacity, which a lot of energy storage systems are. So um, these systems are completely independent systems. They are not uh, incidental or uh, ancillary to any. They're complicated systems, they're dangerous systems, they require the highest degree of electrical theory, electrical experience, and we agree with uh, all three of our electric utilities and with uh, uh, inspectors and building officials around the state that this work should only be done by those who are contractors who are licensed to install standalone systems because that's what these are, independent and standalone systems. Finally, the last page is a picture of a personal protective uh, suit that is used by electrical workers to work on energy storage devices. And when you look at this suit, you can see this tells you how dangerous this work is and how you must have the highest degree of electrical knowledge and experience and code to work on this. So uh, we urge you very strongly to only approve this work for the contractors who can approve, who can install it as standalone systems. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment. Hi, I'm Phil Turret, a C46 holder, and I really liked his speech. And I just want you to remember where it came from. Where these systems evolved from? They evolved from off-grid PV systems that had battery support so people could live without the utility company providing their energy. They're not any different. They're just bigger. Instead of being charged by PV, they're charged by other sources, wind or the utility company, still charging and discharging batteries, which began a lot with the solar industry and the C46. Thank you. Thank you. Any other additional public comment? Dave or Nancy, who wants to go first? Well, I want to make a motion. After hearing this, reading on this, um, and reading the um, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, all the other, Division 8, um, basically what I get out of this is that the storage systems are out of scope with the C46 contractor. So I, my recommendation because of that is to limit the C46 contractors to connecting to an energy electrical energy storage system, but not installing it. Because after what I've heard and read, it can get a lot more than just tying from a PV. It could actually be at our from what I understand and what I've read on these C46 contractors, it can get more, how do you want to say it? It can continue to grow without the CSLB having control of it, and I don't want that. So um, if that's my take. Can I, can I just get clarification? My, cl my a Can I just get is, clarification? Yeah, my motion is to recommend to the full board that a C46 contractor can connect the PV system, photo, photovoltaic, vitalic, whatever you call it, system to the battery battery storage, but not or electrical battery storage, but not to uh, not install an electrical battery storage system. Okay, so just for clarification. Um, 
Whenever you want to modify the interpretation of a regulation, you should proceed through the rulemaking process, which is why the staff had recommended that you conduct hearings to get further information and make changes to the text of the language. Because currently, the C-46 can install, modify, maintain, and repair a system. So they can modify a system. If the work includes modification of a system, either but through storage or otherwise. It, no, it actually then, says solar energy system. Right, so solar photovoltaic, solar, uh, photovoltaic solar energy system is what it says. Mm -hmm. So if you want to further restrict the classification, then what I'd recommend you do is do the public hearings to develop the text to amend the language that I just read you. So that's what I would suggest going forward so that you can defend the interpretation. Does that make sense? You look like you're well, Can I just add one more thing? We have, we have a motion for a second. Let's, let's be yours. Uh, just to continue with the discussion and what you just said, I just want to make sure we kind of clarify the difference between um, the great props that were brought in today, such as the small portable battery versus the very large system that would require a suit, so that we're all thinking about two very different types of energy storage are we we're not can I can I make a comment now on the motion um, you know I appreciate the all the people that were here today to make their presentation and educate us on this whole process uh, as you can see it's not uh, a simple process it's a very technical process and one I think we need to be educated more about including the board and I really think um, in all due respect, uh, Dave, that we need to, I think we, we have a recommendation by the, by the staff to really proceed to look into this, to educate us a little bit more, to get all the facts, to hold public hearings. And if this is any indication of what this issue is in the community, and particularly in this industry, I think we owe it to the industry Whatever, whatever their classification may be, to, to let us hear what they have to say about the issue. I think, I think we owe it to them. So that's why I believe that I support the staff recommendation to hold these hearings, to hold this, these meetings, so that we give an opportunity to all the vested interested parties to come and speak and let us know where they're going with this and how then we can make a decision on it. I think we're premature in making a recommendation in going forward with only one of the classifications. That's my uh, comment. Na Nancy. I would like to hear the committee yeah, comments before taking a vote. i to talk for a little bit here. Sorry, thank you. Um, and Dave, I hear what you're saying and I, I'm uh, hearing what um, Pastor is saying as well because I think we don't want to we want to get that language what it should read because consumer protection is key for me and as a building official um, fire life safety for those consumers that come in and get applications is even more key as well and so these off grids I deal with off-grid systems as well, and they're growing. These systems are not the same as they used to be. These commercial systems are huge. Um, I think it was Mr. Kotler, and sorry if I say the name wrong, he made a lot of key points of, of what I'm concerned with, and that is that um, they're growing. I, I see with just even these little systems, some of the issues with just the basic residential ones were interconnection problems in the wrong feeder sizes. I can't even imagine what would happen with these huge commercial ones that are evolving every day. Um, they're not what they used to be. Um, I've seen where you have to use the special equipment just even to go out and inspect them. We have to wear special equipment as well. We have to get training and safety before we can even enter the sites. Um, I think it's extremely important that when we move forward with this that we are taking in all the information from the industry, from everyone, and that we're having the right um, qualified contractor doing this, that they have the right expertise, the right experience, the right training. Um, and holding the, the right license that we decide in the end that needs to be doing that. Um, there's a lot more than just photovoltaic and just putting the label of system on there, that, that's vague. 
So I think we may be, law if with your current motion, we may be locking ourselves into one specific thing. It might be best to go forward with, you know, having those hearings and those meetings in here and everything to find out what we really needed to say. That's what I would say. Yes. Good. Um, you know, I, I think the, I don't think we're reinterpreting any laws. Uh, to the attorney's point, I don't think that we're making new regulations. I think that we are doing exactly what it states now of C-46 is to install a solar system. Dave's motion was to allow that C-46 to go ahead and connect to the battery system, not to install the battery system. So we're actually giving them something. Um, if they've been installing these, excuse me, let me get control here. You, have the floor. you know, the C-46 is a specialty contractor. There is nothing in our rules that would not allow a C-46 to, to go get a C-10 license and do it with electricians, do it with people who have actually, in California, have a California state certification to be an electrician and understand these systems. Um, I support Dave's motion and I'm ready to go forward with it at this time. Changing, you know, I heard someone say we changed our name to, you know, be ESS, Energy Storage System. I can call myself a doctor. It doesn't mean I'm qualified to do surgery on you. So I'm ready to go forward uh, with the motion. That's what I have to say. And uh, Christy, this is, one, uh, this is one of the things I have an issue, I guess, what I look at. If, with the, and I'm a big proponent of energy efficiency and uh, energy, whatever, uh, renewable energy and all that. What happens if you got a windmill? Okay, that doesn't have anything to do with sto uh, solar, correct? Okay, and then you got PV and you got a backup generator, all hooked into this power uh, battery. Who does it? That's, again, I just don't want that again, scope to get my, bigger. My point is, the fact that we have so much conflict over this regulation to me indicates the regulation should be re-examined and clarified so there isn't conflict over what can and cannot be done with respect to installation or modification of a system. So that's where we can run into legal problems if we aren't clear and we attempt to enforce on someone who's doing that. Work. I totally understand that, but what happens if it takes two or three years and then we have some massive issues in that maybe, time? Maybe you want to look through statutory change. That's faster sometimes, but you know, but my point is getting all the information because this regulation, the first iteration was adopted in the 70s and it's been changed two or three times since then. But as we've indicated, the industry changes over time, things change, and sometimes you need to re-examine your regulations to update them consistent with industry practice and public safety. So I think that providing additional detail, obviously there's some people here, but there may be others that want to provide input as to how that should look. That would, this would be a great opportunity for you to update this regulation or seek legislative changes if you think it's necessary. But I'm worried that you don't have all the information and you may not have the legal authority to proceed with interpretations that you may come up with at meetings. That's my concern. So Madam we have Chair, a... Can I make another comment? Yes. Um, Christy, I think you really hit the nail on the head here. Uh, all industries, and particularly the solar industry, is dynamic, is changing. And I think that we have to understand that, dear, like I used to tell my staff, there's nothing constant but change itself. And this is a change in industry. And we have to kind of look at, th this is an opportunity to review our, our, our regulations, our statutes. And the only way we can do that in a, in a really professional, educated way is to have an opportunity to, to get educated and hold public hearings. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's really, at this point, not appropriate to move ahead and making a decision as your recommendation has proposed, Dave, in all due respect to your recommendation. So I really think it's, it's incumbent to us to really move forward with the staff recommendation. 
And um, I guess we have each of a, a vote, so we can make that decision. So would you like to restate your, your motion? All right, Laura, if you could restate the motion, please, for everyone. I think I have it. Yeah. Uh, recommend to full board C46 can connect to ESS but not to install an ESS. <laughs> I'm sorry. An energy storage system ESS. And you second it, right? Okay. Can we get a roll call? Marla Richardson. No. Dave Diaz. Yeah. Pastor Herrera. No. Ed Lang. No. Frank Shutter. Yes. Johnny Simpson. Yes. Nancy Springer. No. Okay. Three to four, the motion fails. I move that we, um, we uh, move forward with the staff recommendation to hold public hearings. Roll call vote, please. Is there any public comment to move forward with the staff recommendation to hold public hearings for additional information? <coughs> Roll call, please. Marla Richardson. Second. second. Yeah, we do. Second. Marla Richardson, aye. aye. Dave Diaz. Yeah. Pastor Herrera. Aye. Ed Lang. Aye. Frank Shutter. Yeah. Johnny Simpson. Aye. Nancy Springer. Aye. Motion carries. We will now, excuse me, move to I review and discussion of possible action regarding the distribution of funds from the construction management education account. On to page 97. CSLB collects a voluntary contribution from applicants and licensees to fund CMEA, which is intended to provide grants to prepare graduates to fill positions in construction management. The CMEA 11 member advisory committee oversees the funds. CSLB last issued grants in fiscal year 2013 through 2014. At the December 2017 board meeting, the board authorized staff to begin the recruitment process of the advisory committee and to begin issuing grants in fiscal year 2018 to 2019. CSLB staff reached out to each individual, excuse me, identified organization and received their respective nomination. The list of nominees is provided on page 98 of your packet. The staff recommendation is that the licensing committee recommend to the full board approval of the list of nominees to serve on the 2018 through 2021 construction management account advisory committee. Is there any committee members that have comments on this item? Any public comment? We have a motion for the staff recommendation. Yeah. A second. Who made the motion? Yeah, okay. I move. Do we have a second? Uh, to accept the staff recommendation. Second. Thank you. Marla Richardson? Aye. Dave Diaz? Yes. Yeah. Pastor Herrera? I abstain. Ed Lang? Yes. Frank Shutter? Yes. Johnny Simpson? Nancy Springer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item J, 2016 through 2018 strategic plan update discussion of possible action on 2017-2018 licensing and examination objectives. Laura, please provide an update. Um, this chart is on page 101 of the packet. Um, we have a few items where the target date has shifted and we'll talk about them Further, want the item 1.3 we talked about previously in the agenda, reciprocity agreements. Item 1.4 we'll discuss at the April board meeting um, when we talk about strategic planning. 
And an update on item 1.1, um, this is in progress, it's an effort between licensing and public affairs as well as IT. Is there any committee member comment? Public comment? No, no changes, right? No vote needed. The licensing committee uh, meeting is now going to Wait, adjourn. Wait, are we going to adjourn? What is the process for having the attorney removed from the board? What, what would be the process to have the attorney removed and replaced? I'd like that to be a, at the next board. Can I adjourn now? We need a motion. Motion, motion. motion to adjourn. License. Do we have a second? Yeah. That's his recommendation. No. You can just make a recommendation. Uh, motion? Oh, to adjourn. Uh, motion. motion. Oh, roll, whatever. Okay. I'm going to say a second to that. Marla Richardson? Aye. Dave Diaz? Yep. Pastor Herrera? Aye. Ed Lang? Aye. Frank Shatter? Aye. Johnny Simpson? Nancy Springer? Aye. Licensing committee is now adjourned. Thank you.